Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. It's a treat to be teaching again in this environment. Just walking in here, especially into the hall, it's just so amazing. It's a blessing. So almost two years ago, I began a series of talks on the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha's discourse on the four foundations of mindfulness. Now, the opening statement of this sutta, of this discourse, is quite remarkable. The Buddha is making this bold and unambiguous declaration about the power of this practice. He said, and this is the, the opening lines of the sutta, because this is the direct path for the purification of beings for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of suffering and discontent, for the attainment of the noble path, for the realization of Nibbana, namely the four Satipatthanas. So this practice that we're doing the Buddha is declaring to be the direct way to the end of suffering, to the realization of enlightenment. The word satipatthana has been translated in different ways, and each of the translations sort of adds a slightly different perspective or nuance to the meaning. Sometimes satipatthana is translated as the foundations of mindfulness. Sometimes as the arousings of mindfulness. Sometimes it's translated as the abiding in mindfulness, the mindful abidings. And I think each one of those translations in English offers us another window into the meaning of our practice. Foundation, the foundations of mindfulness sort of imply or emphasize the objects upon we upon which we build the mindfulness. So it's in some way emphasizing the objects. They are the foundation for the building of our practice. The arousings of mindfulness suggests the need to cultivate to develop them. It's actually something that needs practice. And if we translate it as the abidings of mindfulness, or the mindful abidings, it seems to emphasize the awareness aspect. That is how we pay attention. But the emphasis is on the attention itself, the mindfulness itself. So I think it's useful, as we go from the Pali into English, to take in all of these meanings, because they fill out, or they enlarge our understanding of what our practice is. Okay, so this is the direct path, namely the four satipatthanas. So the Buddha then goes on in the sutta to say, what are the four? Here, bhikkhus, in regard to the body, one abides contemplating the body, ardent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. In regard to feelings, in regard to the mind, in regard to dhammas, one abides contemplating, ardent, clearly knowing, and mindful, free from desires and discontent in regard to the world. 
So over the last years, we've talked in detail about the first three of these foundations. Talked in detail about mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of the mind. We also began the exploration of the fourth foundation, namely mindfulness of the Dhamma. I'd like to review just a bit the meaning of this last foundation and then pick up where we left off last year. So as you know, the word Dhamma in Pali or Dharma in Sanskrit, the word means the truth or the law or the lawful nature of things, the way things are. Dhamma also means each of the specific elements of the mind and body. So all of the elements of the body, all of the individual elements of the mind, each one is called a dhamma. The term Buddha Dharma or Buddha Dhamma refers then to the Buddha's expression of these universal truths. And I think this is helpful to understand in that the Buddha did not teach Buddhism. You know, he didn't teach a set of beliefs you know, or dogmas that we need to ascribe to. He taught the nature of things. He taught about the lawfulness of things. taught about the nature of the mind and what tendencies, what habituated patterns cause suffering for ourselves and others, and how we can free ourselves from these deeply conditioned patterns. Now, in many translations of the sutta, when we get to this fourth foundation, mindfulness of the Dhamma, It's often translated as mindfulness of mental objects. And so it's mindfulness of the body, feelings, mind, and mental objects. That's a usual translation. But it's a bit confusing. Because many objects of mind, many mental objects, have already been talked about in mindfulness of feelings, in mindfulness of mind, So it means something a little different. And in clarifying exactly what's meant in this fourth foundation of mindfulness, I want to draw on the explanation given in the book by the Venerable Analayo, Satipatthana, The Direct Path to Realization. And this is a wonderful book, which at some point I suggest you look at. And I've drawn a lot from this, you know, throughout all of these talks. He suggests that we understand this fourth foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of the Dhamma, as referring to categories of phenomena. So what does this mean? In this aspect of our practice, when we're focusing our practice in this way, we're highlighting not only the particular elements of the mind and body, but more specifically, how each of these elements functions in our experience. And as we go through the list of what the Buddha included in this foundation, we'll see how this works. Because he included a very comprehensive list of the organizing principles of all his teachings. So it includes contemplation of the hindrances, of the aggregates, of the sense spheres, of the factors of enlightenment, of the Four Noble Truths. So just as an example, if we take desire as a mind state. In the third foundation of mindfulness, we would recognize 
the mind conditioned by desire. In the fourth foundation, we would understand that desire functions as a hindrance, and we would begin to understand what that means. Just to elaborate a bit further, there was a writer who wrote a lot about the forest monks of Sri Lanka. His name was Michael Carithers. And he had a very good explanation for this fourth foundation. He said, In this foundation, the propositions of the doctrine, of the teachings, are transmuted into direct perception. And I like that. I like that phrase. The teachings, the propositions of the teachings, are transmuted into direct perception. It's a wonderful way of expressing it because it brings the teachings alive for us. It transforms the way we live. Instead of it being merely a philosophical analysis, you know, these are the aggregates and these are the Four Noble Truths, and instead of just some philosophical system, in this foundation of mindfulness, the Buddha is showing us how to investigate these truths, these dhammas, So we transmute them from philosophy into our own direct experience. So this is just the general background to this fourth foundation, mindfulness of the dhammas, of how elements of mind and body function. The Buddha opens this section with a rhetorical question which, as in all rhetorical questions, he then goes on to answer. So he says, And how, bhikkhus, does one in regard to dhammas abide contemplating dhammas? So he's asking, okay, how do we do this? He says, here, in regard to dhammas, one abides contemplating dhammas, first, in terms of the five hindrances. Now, it's interesting that the Buddha began this section with the hindrances. Why? Because if we're not mindful of how different mind states function as hindrances in our practice, they envelop the mind, they proliferate in the mind, and obstruct a wise discernment. They hinder the mind from developing concentration. They hinder the mind from developing the other factors of enlightenment. They prevent the realization of the Four Noble Truths. So in order to proceed on the spiritual path, the spiritual journey, we need to learn and practice, learn how to and practice working with these hindering forces that surely will arise, as we all know. They come. They're deeply conditioned patterns. So we need to know how to recognize them, how to work with them. So in previous talks, we already discussed the first four of these hindrances of desire and aversion, sloth and torpor, and restlessness. Tonight, I'd like to continue with the discussion of the last of them, namely doubt. Now, as with each of the other hindrances, the Buddha outlined five steps for working with and overcoming doubt. So again, this is the instructions in the sutta. The Buddha said, if doubt is present, one knows there is doubt in me. If doubt is not present, one knows there is not doubt in me. There is no doubt in me. One knows how unarisen doubt can arise, how arisen doubt can be removed, 
and how a future arising of doubt can be prevented. So first we have to recognize, is it present in me or not? And then we have to know how to work with it when it is. So there's just a little side note here about the Buddha's use of language. Well, from the ultimate standpoint, there's no self, there's no I, there's no me. And this is found many times in the sutta, this, this understanding of selflessness, emptiness of self. Still in a conventional way, conventional reality, in everyday language, the Buddha is saying, is doubt present in me? Or is it not present in me? So right here we have the integration of the relative and ultimate truths. On the conventional level, we and the Buddha would speak of I and self and me. Are the hindrances present in me? They're not present in me. Conventional usage, we use those terms. Even as we understand that on a more ultimate level, we understand the emptiness of self. Okay, so how do we recognize whether doubt is present in me or not? How do we learn to recognize it? We need to understand the nature and character of this doubting mind. It's the mind of uncertainty. It's the mind of wavering, of indecision. It's like coming to a crossroads. You're on some journey and you come to a crossroads and you don't know which way to go. Do I turn left? Do I turn right? And because of the doubt, because of the indecision, we don't go any place. Unnoticed. Doubt is quite a dangerous mind state because when it's unnoticed, doubt has the power to bring our practice to a standstill. It's like being at that crossroads and not going anywhere. When doubt is present in the mind, we get caught up in the indecision, in the bewilderment, and we don't do anything. When doubt is strong and we're paralyzed by indecision, this mental force doesn't even allow us the opportunity to take a wrong turn and to learn from our mistakes. Rather, we're always checking ourselves. We're vacillating. We're trying to decide. I had a strong example of this on the very first long retreat I did uh, with the Tibetan teacher it was kind of a one dharma situation it was a lot of Vipassana people uh, practicing some for the first time the Dzogchen practice in a Zen monastery this was in upstate New York and that was that so so it was a real western one dharma event And the first month, it was a two-month retreat, the first month, my mind was just going back and forth. I would hear these teachings, and, I mean, part of my mind was incredibly inspired. But the metaphysics was quite different than the Theravada teachings, you know, the the metaphysical system. And so I'd hear them, and i think, wow, that sounds great, but, you know, what about this? It says this in the Pali Canon, and who's right, and who's wrong, and... I just kept going back and forth and back and forth, tormenting myself. Finally, and it took quite a while to resolve this in myself, because I was trying to figure it out, you know, conceptually and intellectually. And it was really just doubt. Finally, it was resolved when I saw that all of the teachings could be held 
as different skillful means. So rather than thinking in terms of right and wrong, I just saw all the time that this is a skillful means for freeing the mind. This is a skillful means for freeing the mind. And when I saw it in that light, rather than as statements of some absolute truth, it became much easier to relax and just take the benefit of the teachings. But until I could resolve those doubts, I really wasn't practicing anything. I was just thinking. Well, there's a wonderful line from uh, the book it came out a few years ago. You might remember The Life of Pi by Jan Martel. It's uh, quite an interesting novel. But in it he wrote, To choose doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. And that's what that mind state of doubt does for us. So in the context of the Satipatthana Sutta, doubt refers to doubts about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. And this has some broad implications, more than we might realize. Because in meditation practice, These can take some very particular forms. Most of us probably have a fair amount of confidence in the Buddha and his teachings, otherwise probably wouldn't be here. But still, different kinds of doubts can arise. You know, we're practicing, but then the thought may come, well... You know, he lived a couple of thousand years ago. Is what he teaching really applicable now? You know, or is this just some teaching, or at least parts of it, from, you know, a very distant time and place? This doubt might be useful if it leads us to a further investigation. But it's not useful if it just triggers an automatic rejection of things we'd rather not hear, of things that for whatever reason we find unpalatable. Now, because the Buddha was very direct, he was very straight. So he said a lot of things that might offend in one way or another some of our sensibilities. If we have a kind of doubt, well, you know, that was okay back then, but it doesn't really apply to us. If we have that kind of doubt, and instead of investigating, instead of using it to test it, we just use it as a way of, you know, automatically rejecting what we may not easily open to, then it becomes a big hindrance. So just for example, it might be the teachings the Buddha gave, the very realistic teachings about the nature of the body, of seeing the body just as it is, you know, and seeing it also in its unbeautiful aspects. And in the Satipatthana Sutta itself, there's a whole section on what are called the cemetery contemplations, where he suggested going to the charnel grounds, of course, it's difficult to do in this country, and just watching the dead bodies decompose, you know, over a series of days. And the description in the sutta is quite vivid of actually what happens to the body with the recollection that just as it happens to this body I'm observing, so it will happen to this body I call my own. Well, in our culture contemplating this very unattractive, even repulsive nature of the body is not something we generally uh, warm up to very well. You know, so do we just reject it, or do we kind of allow ourselves to, oh, well, what's this about? You know, what effect would this actually have on my mind, on freeing the mind from attachment? Or this doubt 
might take the form of you know, just a rejection of certain aspects of the teachings of karma, you know, that we don't maybe fully yet understand. Say, oh, well, that was just from, you know, ancient India, and that's what they believed. Again, it's not suggesting that we uncritically believe, but it is suggesting that we don't uncritically disbelieve. We want to stay open. If we're not aware of the doubt, it might prevent that. At different times, particularly when we're having difficulties in our practice, we might begin to have doubts about the practice itself. You know, you're here and you're sitting and walking and almost everybody at different times faces faces difficulties and things are not going easily. And so doubts can begin to arise, you know, about the practice. What is sitting here hour after hour, day after day, watching my breath have to do with anything? You know, there's just a feeling this is really useless. And it might lead us to be comparing different practices. Oh, Tibetan chanting sounds good. You know, Sufi dancing or something, you know, a little more joie de vivre. Or wondering, we might start wondering about the value of the practice, the value of meditation, of just sitting here quietly watching our breaths. What's the value of this in a world that's full of suffering? What is it doing for anybody? Now these, these thoughts can arise. These doubts can arise. Or we might really have quite a firm, stable faith in the practice, but we might have doubt about our ability to do it. You know, and so this becomes the very deep pattern of self-doubt. Am I doing it right? I can't do it. It's too hard. It's not the right time. Should have waited. All kinds of thoughts coming into the mind, particularly in times of difficulty. When there is a strong pattern in our minds of self-doubt, it can become a very debilitating force in our lives because we can get into the habit of frequently undermining ourselves, of holding back. And there's an interesting phrase in English. You know, we say someone is plagued by doubt. This is a very interesting expression, plagued by doubt. When we look at the mind state itself, when we look at it directly, it is like a plague that weakens us. Because instead of making the experiment, whether it's in meditation or anything else, and engaging in the experience to see for ourselves, is this beneficial, is it not beneficial? The mind simply gets lost in endless speculation. Then doubt becomes self-fulfilling, because staying lost in these doubting thoughts, really is useless. And we're not actually moving forward. Doubt doesn't allow us to move forward and investigate the experience for ourselves. And this endless conjecture, is this right? Am I doing it okay? This isn't the right time. This is useless. It's not helping anybody. Whatever a particular form it takes, this endless thought loop is exhausting. Doubt is often likened to a thorny mind that keeps jabbing us. You know, and how do we feel when we get continually jabbed? We feel irritable, we feel dissatisfied, we feel discouraged. This is all the effect of this hindrance of doubt, which is why we need to 
in this fourth foundation of mindfulness, understand this mind state and how it functions as a hindrance. So we really see it and understand it deeply and clearly. Now the great seduction of doubt, and this is where it's so tricky, is because it very often comes masquerading as wisdom. Now we hear these very wise sounding voices in our minds. And these voices, they're very reasonable. You know, they sound very reasonable. And so then we get caught up in the the endless thought loops, not recognizing them as being the doubting mind. So the first step is learning to recognize when doubt arises, knowing doubt is in me. We need to see that, we need to recognize it, become familiar with our own particular tapes, and we each might express them in our own way. Thought comes, I can't do this, doubting tape. I'm not doing it right, doubting tape. What's the point of it all, doubting tape? So whatever it is for you, whatever way you see it being expressed, Recognize it for what it is. Now the next part of the instruction is equally important, and that is noting when doubt is not present. As the Buddha said, knowing when doubt is not present in me. So we can do this in two ways. In your practice, at those times when things are moving along, they're moving along easily, there's a fair degree of mindfulness, the concentration feels reasonably steady and stable. Notice the quality of the mind at that time. In other words, look at the mind and notice what it's like without doubt. Because at those times the mind will be free of doubt. So we pay attention to it. We recognize that doubt is not present in me. But not just to know that conceptually or intellectually, we're actually seeing the quality of the mind when it is free of doubt. The second way of noticing this is paying particular particular attention in times of transition. So, for example, if at a particular time you're lost in a storm of doubt, you know, and the mind is just being filled with all these thoughts and you're caught up in them, but there's enough mindfulness to reckon, oh, doubt, 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 yes, doubt is present in me, doubt, doubt. So then just watch for the time of transition because it will be there, 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 be there. And then at a certain point, the doubt will change. Pay attention to that moment when the doubt is no longer there. And then contrast. That's a powerful moment. That that moment of transition is a powerful a moment to pay attention to because it reveals experientially the difference between the mind influenced by a hindrance of noticing what hindrance means and the mind free of hindrance. So we get a very clear picture of this and it's a direct application of the Buddhist teachings. Okay, so we notice when doubt is present in me and when doubt is not present. Then the Buddha says, we should then investigate the causes for doubt to arise and how to remove it once it has. So what is the cause of doubt? 
You know, what feeds it? What nourishes doubt? Buddha said that the proximate cause for doubt is unwise attention. He said, there are bhikkhus, things that are the basis for doubt. Frequently giving careless and unwise attention to them is the nutriment for their arising and increasing. Giving wise attention to them becomes the cause of their diminishing and disappearance. So unwise attention to the bases for doubt. We experience unwise attention in different ways. And one is not paying careful attention in the moment to the moment. Not seeing what our own particular bases are for the arising of doubt. We're not paying careful attention in the moment. We won't recognize, okay, what's, what's our own particular causes for doubt to arise? What are the particular thoughts that arise within us that trigger doubt? So unwise attention really has to do with what I've often called the state of more or less mindfulness. You know, when we're going along in our sitting and our walking through the day and we're kind of present, but not carefully present. You know, so we're kind of in the illusion that, yeah, I'm practicing, I'm kind of more or less here. But it's not close attention. And so we miss the bases for our doubt arising. And it's really a kind of unwise attention in the moment. And in that unwise attention, or the more or less mindfulness, what happens is that unnoticed thoughts gather momentum, and they begin to dominate the mind stream. I had a very striking example of this. Uh, the year after Saida Upandita first came to teach at IMS, this was in 84, the following year I went to sit with him in Asia, first in Nepal and then in Burma. And the conditions in Nepal, the monastery we were at, the conditions were just terrible. It's like there were four or five of us in this bare room, sleeping on a cement floor. It was right next to the latrines, so the smells were... And my mind was really grumpy. <laughs> you know, it was very noisy. It was just everything. The conditions were sort of the polar opposite of what we have here. <laughs> And so I had a lot of judgment, just a lot of doubt about everything. You know, what am I doing here? So I went in and I reported it to Sayadaw. And he just gave me the, the, the simplest response. All he said to me after my report was, be more mindful. And the first thought in my mind was, thanks a lot. <laughs> you know... I knew that. <laughs> you know, so I kind of dismissed it. You know, it was just like I thought it was some platitude. Well, just be more mindful. But then I went outside and I was doing some more meditation. I thought, well, you know, he's this great meditation master. Maybe I should actually try doing what he said. So I actually tried to be more mindful. I, I started paying closer and closer attention, just in a very simple way, just to the feeling of the step. What were the sensations? I brought the mind in very close. And it was amazing. It was exactly the right prescription. In the close attention, in the wise attention to the moment, in the moment, all those doubts and judgments and all of those hindrances just fell away. There was no room for them because the attention was so close to the object. So sometimes the simplest teaching 
is precisely and exactly what we have to do. And the Buddha is saying this in the sutta. The proximate cause for doubt and many of the other hindrances is unwise attention. So when we see it arising, we bring a close attention. There's another very far-reaching aspect of what unwise attention means. So it's not only unwise or careless attention to the moment, in the moment. Another aspect of unwise attention that gives rise to doubt is not knowing what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, is not knowing what is skillful and what is unskillful. Because without this wise discernment, we are not able to overcome the forces of greed and hatred and delusion in the mind. If we don't know, if we don't deeply understand what's wholesome, what's unwholesome, there will be no way for us to really free ourselves from the strong powers of greed, of desire, of aversion, of delusion. And through not knowing what brings happiness, what brings peace, what brings suffering, we stay stuck in the quagmire of many wrong actions. Because we don't know. We don't have that discernment. And as we get stuck in this morass of wrong action, This becomes a great feeding ground for doubt. So just just as an example of this, and this is one example of countless ones, many people, common understanding, is that, is the belief that the accumulation of more and more sense pleasures in one's life will bring us happiness. You know, and all of us, to some extent, believe that and live that out, even though we may have, you know, a deeper place of understanding as well. But for many people, this is the understanding. This is the belief. You know, that life and happiness is about accumulating more and more sense pleasures. But that's kind of like drinking salt water as a way of quenching thirst. You know, the more we drink, the thirstier we get. Without knowing what's skillful, what's unskillful, without understanding where different actions lead, we end up doing a lot of things in our lives that don't bring about their promised results. You know, on the internet, And on email spam, it's amazing how many messages there are basically with the message, increase your desire. You know, and then it just, whatever particular thing they're selling, just increase you as if that's the value, if that's the direction we want to go. Yes, increase your desire and then you'll be happy. Well, to the extent that we are acting this one out, or many other misunderstandings. It's not going to lead to its promised result. And sometimes, of course, it actually leads to suffering. So all of this just becomes a breeding ground for doubt, because there's just confusion about what we're doing in our lives. We're not actually accomplishing what we want. We're not getting what we want. Why? We don't understand why. And so a lot of doubt about what we're doing, you know, and the choices we make begins to arise. So an example of this, which Moon Indraji, my first teacher, used to use a lot. When he first came to this country, and we were all very 
you know, enthusiastic about the meditative process, but we weren't at that time talking a lot about sila, you know, about morality. Because we thought people didn't want to hear about that. They really wanted to hear about enlightenment and awakening and, you know, sila is kind of... But it became very apparent after a while that without the understanding of sila, of morality, things don't go anyplace. And Manindra gave this wonderful example. He said, it's like being in a rowboat, you know, wanting to cross the river and rowing and rowing and rowing and putting all of one's effort and energy into it, but not untying the boat from the dock. You know, you don't untie the boat, no matter how much effort you put into the rowing, you don't go anyplace. Well, if we're doing that, if we're in that situation, I would imagine that quite a lot of doubts would begin to arise. You know, because we're putting all this effort into nothing is happening. So we need to understand, and this is the Buddha is pointing this out, we need to understand what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, what is skillful and what is unskillful, because that provides a clarity for the choices we make and what we do and an understanding of correctly anticipates anticipated results. Now, for this reason, there's there's a a rather counterintuitive teaching, which always, I like it because it's, it's, it's a little startling, where it says it's better to do an unskillful act knowing it's unskillful than to do an unskillful act not knowing. You know, and I think most of us would think, well, if we didn't know it was bad, then it's not quite as bad as if we did it knowing all the time that it was the wrong thing to do. But the Buddha's saying something else. He's saying, if we're going to do an unwholesome act, it's better to know that it's unwholesome. Why? Because... Even if, you know, under some delusion we still go ahead and do it, still there are those seeds of wisdom within it. We know it's unwholesome. And those seeds of wisdom provide the possibility of some future restraint, of really learning from what we're doing. When we don't know it's unwholesome, then we're just moving blithely ahead in total delusion, total ignorance. There's not much hope of our extricating ourselves from that pattern because we don't know. What perhaps is unique to the teachings of the Buddha is that we overcome doubt not through belief, not even through faith, but through our ability to distinguish for ourselves this is wholesome, this is not wholesome, this is skillful, this is not skillful. Within the Buddha's teachings, the antidote to doubt, the cure for doubt, the way to prevent future unarisen doubt from arising is through investigation. It's through the wisdom mind. That's what overcomes doubt. Through seeing for ourselves what is skillful, what is not skillful. So although the Buddha and other teachers can point directly to this aspect of wholesome and unwholesome, and I'm going to talk more about that next week. Still, we come to understand this wisdom deeply through our own efforts, through our own investigation. We come to see it through the wisdom factor of our own minds. So we overcome doubt by hearing and studying the teachings, but then through our own investigation of them, 
each one of us knowing for ourselves, this is wholesome, this is unwholesome, this is skillful, this is not skillful. And it's interesting that out of this wisdom, we then develop, out of wisdom, we then develop a greater faith and confidence in the Buddha and in the Dharma, in the teachings, in the Sangha. We develop greater confidence in ourselves, greater faith in ourselves. And all of this gives uh, a more profound meaning when we take refuge. And we take refuge in the Buddha, in the Dharma, in the Sangha. It takes a much more profound meaning for us when it's grounded in our own experience, at least to some extent, our own verified experience. Yes, this is true. We see it for ourselves. And it's this confidence, this understanding, this wisdom, which leads us onward through all the stages of awakening. So I would just like to close with one teaching, and this is from a Tibetan teacher's, uh, his name is Tsongkhapa. He was from the 14th century or 13th century, and kind of the founder of the, the lineage of the Dalai Lama. He said, the human body at peace with itself is more precious than the rarest gem. Cherish your body, it is yours this one time only. The human form is one with great difficulty. It is easy to lose. All worldly things are brief, like lightning in the sky. This life you must know as the tiny splash of a raindrop, a thing of beauty that disappears even as it comes into being. Therefore, set your aspiration and make use of every day and night to achieve it. Let's sit for a few minutes.